There's a little short book in the Bible called 3 John. It has only 14 verses, and six of them only have only two or three lines. But one of these verses says, Do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. And what is your life an imitation, my friend? We're studying today about imitations, so stay with us. I know the Lord will find a way for me. In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe the Bible is a revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. My warmest greetings to you, my friend, and welcome to our program of Bible study, In Search of the Lord's Way to Become and to Live Like a Christian. It's so good to know that you're with us, and uh, we can't know that unless you let us hear from you. So I hope you'll write us or call us this week. Oh no, I'm not saying send us money. We're not here to export you financially or any other way for that matter. We're sponsored on this station by members of Churches of Christ in the area, and I'm salaried by the Edmond, Oklahoma Church of Christ, so I'm not soliciting money here for me or either for the ministry. We're just encouraged by your response, and we'd like to hear from you how the program has been a blessing to you. And we pray we'll both be blessed by our study together today. For many years, I preached from the King James Version of the Bible. However, you may have noticed in the last three or four years or so, I, I've been using um, the New King James Version, which I find interesting and helpful in many ways. As we know, a living language such as the English language is a changing one. The Word of God never changes but the meaning of the English word used to convey the thought in our language may change. New words are added to every new edition of our English dictionaries, and some old words have become outdated and they're dropped from use. And um, since that's basically what the New King James Version of the Bible has done, replaced some obsolete words with their more commonly used synonyms, it often affords me some new sights into the scriptures, and that's the case with today's text. In my private reading recently, I came upon the, this passage in 1 Thessalonians that struck me as really interesting, and I thought it would be so with you too. And that's what we'll be reading very shortly. If you think you might want a free printed copy of the message or a free audio cassette tape of the entire program, simply write us in search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, uh, Edmond, Oklahoma 73083, or email us at searchtv at aol.com. Uh, or you may use our toll-free telephone number and talk with one of us. That number is 1-800-321-8633. Ken Heldbrand is going to lead us now as we sing, and then I'll be back for Bible reading and, and prayer. Oh, yes, in case you missed it, we're closed captioned.
I, we're reading today from uh, the book of 1 Thessalonians, and we read from the second chapter. And in this second chapter, the Apostle Paul is talking about his entrance in among them when he preached to them the first time in the first few verses of uh, uh, Acts, the 17th chapter, and uh, how they received him and so on. And then he begins in verse 13 to talk about his, uh, their conversion. And he says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because <clears throat> when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are in, Jesus, in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. We read through verse 16. Now let us pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to you for your word, the Bible, and uh, that we are able to own a copy of it and have it in our homes and we can read it aloud on the airways just as we have. And how thankful we are that for this freedom which you have given us and, and uh, we consider it a gift from you. Now be with us and bless those in a special way, those who have special needs who have asked a part in our prayers to you today. Their needs are varied, as you know, but here is now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I guess uh, I personally have always thought of imitation as, uh, well, I suppose I'd have to say a negative word. As I said once before in another program, when I began preaching, I tried hard to mimic one of my esteemed mentors until someone spoke to me about it and convinced me uh, a mimic would never be as effective as the original. Then I tried to develop my own style and delivery, which uh, is most likely not as good as his, but uh, I wanted to be original and not a copy or an imitation or a counterfeit of someone else. However, when I went to the dictionary and when I saw these passages in uh, the scripture and others, uh, I learned that to mimic or to imitate some people and some things can be a good thing. Some people and some things are worthy of emulation, you know. Our English word mimic is a direct translation from the language of the New Testament for, which, for the word which is also translated in the King James Version, follower. But in the New King James Version, it's translated imitate. For example, in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 16, Paul says, Therefore I urge you to imitate me. In 11, chapter 11, verse 6, he wrote again, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. In Ephesians 5 and 1, he wrote, therefore be imitators of God as dear children. In Hebrews 6, 11, and 12, there's the encouragement 
uh, not to become sluggish, but imitate those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. Then, of course, there's um, our text that says in verse 14, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. In all those verses, Christians are being urged to be imitators. Imitators first of God and of Christ, and imitators of Paul as he imitated Christ, imitators of those heroes of the faith mentioned in what we sometimes call God's Hall of Fame there in Hebrews 11. And finally, Gentile churches were imitating the churches in Judea. All that's good. It was good for churches who came along later to be imitators of the admirable churches established under the divine guidance of the Holy Spirit in Judea. In the preceding verses, the apostle has been of a thankful spirit for his introduction to them, that it was not in vain. He reminded them that after having been treated spitefully in Philippi, that he and his missionary companions came to their town and were bold to speak to them the gospel of God with gentleness of a, cur of a caring nurse. For this reason, he says, we also thank God without ceasing because when, we, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, the word of God which also works in you who believe. I need to remind you now that these people, like the Athenians to whom Paul spoke, had not known God before. They had their own gods, but not God. But so far, powerful is the gospel of God that when they heard it, they received it and they were converted to God. They had not received Paul's message merely as Paul's opinion, or his interpretation, but indeed as it truly was and is to this day the Word of God. And that Word had worked effectively in the, their lives as it always does in the lives of people who believe. He had complete confidence in it as the power of God to the salvation of those who will believe it, Romans 1.16. And it still works. It has no substitutes. Paul was not ashamed of the gospel. He preached it. He preached it, not just when it seemed by, uh, to be acceptable uh, uh, with the people, but even when it resulted in extremely adverse treatment. And that's what he had done here. Read about it in Acts 17, verses 1 to 9. The persecution that had um, been in Jerusalem and Judea was initiated by the Jews, and um, maybe initiated by the Jews in Thessalonica, but carried on against Paul uh, uh, by his own brethren. And it was this suffering uh, which Paul and the new church there had experienced that Paul referenced in this verse that we're studying today. The Thessalonians were imitating the churches in Judea in the persecution and the persecutors that Paul mentioned, especially in the text. I've said that twice so you'll understand I'm not taking the verse out of the context to make it say something it was not intended to say. I understand that kind of hermeneutic. A passage doesn't mean what the writer intended, but what the reader wants it to mean. But I don't believe that. And Jesus charged his apostles that when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were to begin their witnessing in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and then to Samaria, and then to the end of the earth, Acts 1.8. Therefore, it was the divine plan that the church had its beginning in Jerusalem, spread throughout all Judea, then to Samaria, and eventually to Europe, Thessalonica, and other cities in Europe, and and many years later, as far as to the United States of America, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And the church in Thessalonica was mimicking or imitating those churches of God in Judea. You see, this was not a different kind of denomination that Paul had established in Thessalonica, as people today think of churches as being different denominations, believing and teaching 
different things about God and about Christ and, uh, and about the Holy Spirit and salvation and worship and all that. Not that at all. The church in Thessalonica in Europe was the same, of the same mind, the same teaching, the same faith, the same hope, and coping with the same kind of persecution from some of the same people as the churches of God in Judea. There was that commonality between them. Then I ask you, would there be anything wrong with churches in America, in the 21st century America, trying to mimic or imitate the first century churches of God in Judea? To the contrary, it'd be a great ideal. It'd be as desirable and as commendable now as it was then. Is it possible to be a church like that one in Judea and Thessalonica nowadays? If not, why not? Say, why don't churches today mimic? Why don't we try imitating the churches of God in Judea? Well, it seems to me the first problem that idea presents is how can we know what the church was like in Jerusalem and what kind of churches were those in Judea? What did they believe and teach? They had no formal creed or confession of faith or catechism. They were guided by 12 men to whom Jesus had promised and God had given the baptism of the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. I mean, to remind them of all he had taught them and more than that, he would later reveal to them other things, John 14 through 20, uh, 14, 26 and John 16, 7 through 15. Then our Lord worked with them, confirming their teaching by signs which followed them. Mark 16, verse 20. Later, as out of due time, God chose another one to join them. His name was Saul, who is called Paul, whom he sent to the Gentile world. It was Paul who wrote that by revelation he, that is God, made known to me the revelation as I have briefly written already by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 3 and 4. Remember? He said in our text, uh, our text that when he preached the gospel of God in Thessalonica the people received it not as the word of a man, but as it is indeed the word of God. If we're as noble as they, we'd accept the apostolic teaching in the in New Testament, not as the word of mere men, but truly as the word of God. And we'd treat it so. And when we do that, we will imitate the church that's described there. Of course we will. Where the Bible and the Bible alone is preached and taught, the result will be the same. You can count on it. The New Testament will make an, uh, an imitation of the churches of God in Judea just as it did in Thessalonica. However, according to World Christian Encyclopedia, there are currently 33,830 denominations, 33,830 evidences that something else or something more or something less is being taught or marketed under the label of Christianity. And incidentally, if professed believers in the Bible could get as riled up about the common, ordinarily abuse of the Bible, as some did recently about the alleged abuse of the Koran, the holy book of the Muslim religion, it's very possible we'd not be living in the conditions we are today. A church is a church of God or a church of Christ, just as the ones in Judea, only as far as it possesses the same qualities and characteristics of those churches that existed then. A and those are the qualities and characteristics taught in the New Testament. However, some scoff at the idea, despite the fact that some teach that being a good imitation of New Testament church isn't, it just isn't practical for our times, 
Well, they'd like us to believe primitive Christianity just isn't for postmodern man living in a postmodern world. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is universal in time as well as scope, my friend. It's never been outdated or become irrelevant in whatever the prevailing philosophy uh, man finds himself. In the commission, Jesus said, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 18, 20. Some of the intellectuals of the first century to whom the apostle Paul preached in Athens scoffed, and they mocked too. They called him a seed picker, a country bumpkin, an unlearned person who'd come in from out in the country when he preached the resurrection of Christ from the dead. But he believed it, and he preached it nevertheless. The kind of Christianity, the kind of church described in the New Testament isn't old-fashioned or out of date, my friend. It's as timely and as relevant as the morning's newspaper. And it should be the aim of every church in every city and town and village everywhere to imitate the church described in the New Testament. Let us pray. Father, we thank you now for this teaching that you have given us about imitating Christianity in the first century. We pray you to help us to do that in our lives and in the churches. In Jesus' name, amen. My friend, it's been great to have you with us today. I pray you've been blessed by our study as much as I've been in preparing it. I'm simply thrilled when I found those many Bible passages that encourage us to imitate God, imitate Christ, imitate Paul as he imitated Christ, or to imitate the churches of Judea. People fall away from Christ, and divisions come among professed followers of Christ when they don't know, and they're not taught, and they don't follow the Lord's way as taught in the Scriptures. I know it's absolutely inconceivable to some that a person could be honestly objective in these things. But whatever others do, I'm committed to being just a Christian. I know I'll never be a perfect Christian, 
I'll keep learning more about it as long as I live. And no church of Christ I've ever known claimed to have perfectly imitated the church of the Bible. However, uh, our humanity, our uh, immaturity in, in no way excuses conscious uh, uh, in, an intentional disobedience is far more noble to strive for that divine perception and fall short of it in some respects than to comfortably sit down uh, and, and settle down to the creeds and doctrines of mere men, whoever those men may be. I've never read Luther's Catechism or Camel's Declaration and Address, so I'm not committed to them or to any other creed. I refuse to subscribe to a creed by whatever name it wears, confession of faith or questionnaire or whatever. It thrills my soul to know that I can become a Christian and be a member of the church that neither Luther or Camel built, but the one Jesus said I will build, and that others of the same mind will welcome me wherever all around the world I go. Will you come along with me? I pray you will, and you'll be my brother or my sister in the Lord. Then when life's finished here for both of us, Christ who died and opened up the way for us, will welcome you and me, both of us, and usher us into our heavenly home. Oh, I'm looking forward to that day. I'm ready to go right now if it should be his will. Are you my friend? If you're not, you need to hurry and get ready for the time may be sooner than either of us thinks. Just open your Bible and see what it says about uh, being saved. We're saved by the blood of Jesus. Believing in Jesus is the beginning place. Do you believe? If so, you need to repent. God commands all men everywhere to repent. And Galatians 3, 26, 28 says, For you all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So you need to be baptized into Christ. And if you haven't done that, may I urge you to do it today. We're presented here by Churches of Christ who would love to have you worship with them at your earliest uh, opportunity, and I hope you'll be right away. If you'd like an audio cassette tape of the program, we gave you the address a while ago, and uh, we pray that you'll use it. We hope to be back next week. Maybe you will too. God bless you now. We love you.